Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. We've been talking about Joshua, and the thing he is most famous for is having fit the Battle of Jericho, as twere. So let's talk about Jericho. What was Jericho? <laughs> uh, clearly, it was a... Um a spiritual manifestation of uh, humanity's greater social consciousness of evil that had to be conquered before mankind is able to conquer uh, the rest of the world with goodness, right? Is That's what I've learned from German higher criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I'm surprised you said German higher criticism because I could mention some more relevant immediate sources, but we won't go there right now. Not one of a lot of nasty uh, emails. Uh, yeah, well, you can send those nasty emails to <laughs> halting towards Zion at gmail.com. <laughs> oh, we are uh, about 40 some years after the Exodus. Moses is dead, Joshua's assumed command. They've crossed over Jordan, which God parted for them miraculously, so that he baptized the new generation. And as soon as they crossed, Joshua arranged for the circumcision of the males of that generation because it hadn't been done in the wilderness. We're not ever told exactly why not. You can probably draw some inferences, though, based on mm. the general unfaithfulness of the previous generation. Uh, that, yeah, <laughs> that, that would be the, the obvious direction to go with that. Uh, the timing is significant because it's the 10th of uh, Abib, when the sun, mm. the, the, the first month, the month where Passover is just come up around the corner. The 10th day is the day when Passover lambs are chosen for inspection. They, they come across and they, they set up, as the waters are parted, they set up memorial stones from the shore in the bottom of the river and take rocks from the bottom of the river and put them up on shore so that when the water's running low, you can look down and say, wow, how did rocks get stacked on the bottom? And at other times, how did these river rocks that have obviously been more and smooth by a river end up stacked here? So that when children were to ask their fathers in times to come, what mean ye by these stones? There'd be an immediate remembrance of the great things that God had done for his people. So this has happened, and they're across, they're on this plain that's going to be called Gilgal, <clears throat> which means rolling, because God is going to roll the shame and the reproach of, of Egypt away from them, beginning with the circumcision. And beyond that is the pass that leads up through the mountains toward Jerusalem and, and into the heart of the promised land. But stationed on the corner of that road is the city of Jericho. It's been there a long time. It's a very ancient city. And it has uh, it was an obvious place to build a city. <clears throat> it's guarding the pass that leads from here to everywhere. Now, the children of Israel had to take this city if they're going to take the promised land, because if they just park here, they're on a plane with a river at their bank. That's suicide. Mm -hmm. There's really no way to, to do a siege. They, they've interrupted the harvest. They're, they're, they have some food, but it's going to run out fast. Interestingly enough, the uh, archaeological digs in Jericho have discovered pots of seeds, which is unusual because usually when a, a, an invading army takes a city, they grab all the foodstuffs for themselves, but God had told Israel not to. So to this day, there's still evidence that Israel left the foodstuffs alone. Uh, they can't simply go by the city and go on their merry way into the heart of the promised land because then Jericho with its soldiers will be right behind them at their tail. So <laughs> this, this has to happen. Let me read here for a moment. <clears throat> Aside from standing on a high hill, the city was oblong. It covered nine acres. Its compound outer wall was six times the height of a man. Compound, that is, it had a lower retaining wall and then a wall built on top of that. And then from there, the banks sloped up toward yet another wall, an inner wall. Its massive inner wall stood further up on an inclined earth embankment covered with plaster. I've only seen one or two references to the plaster, and that may still be a matter of debate, but taken it at face value, it sounds like, uh, at least in some places, if you could somehow uh, scale the retaining wall and the wall on top of that and jump over, you would still be going up an embankment, but it would be like trying to climb the the cement underpinnings of an overpass, a freeway overpass. Mm. You're trying to run up concrete mm. without any footholds or anything else, while people above you 
looking over yet another wall, can <laughs> shoot things at you, throw things at you, or jump water slushies. Balloons. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 there's no way this is good. The city was, for all practical purposes, impregnable. There was no way to take the city by human standards, and yet they had to. It's the first fruits of the battle. And so Joshua goes out one night to to look it over while everybody else is recovering from radical surgery that incapacitates normal human males. <clears throat> and as he does this, this is what the text says. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua was a warrior. He's been a warrior for a long time, 40 years and more. Uh, and so he's, he's looking at the city, and it's looking very defensed. <laughs> Probably he's looking a very um, discouraged himself. Like, how are we supposed to do this? And then he sees somebody. He sees a soldier, man in armor, with a sword drawn. Joshua does not simply jump on him, but he, he, he comes up. Uh, probably with his own sword drawn, and says, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the figure says, no. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> there is this fallacy in logic called false dilemma. Uh, we, we see it used all the time in arguments, you know, Republican, Democrat, better red than dead, uh, McDonald's or Burger King cooker card. You know, um, <laughs> but sometimes when you back away and, and, and postulate a third choice, that third choice can throw everything into stark relief. You see that it's not at all what you thought. How about Burger Kings or McDonald's or healthy, grease-free, fat-free food unprocessed? Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Shh, I'm not supposed to talk about such things. That, that, that changes everything. Yes. The arm figure goes on, but it's Captain... Of the host of the Lord, I am now come. Captain of the Lord's host. We run into this person a number of times. God is called the God of armies, so Lord Sabaoth, Lord of hosts. And here's the captain. Yeah, so host is not the person who's having the dinner party at their house. No, the host, <laughs> <laughs> the host is, is a military force, in this case, a force of angels, numbering in the millions or billions. And this is the king of the angels, the leader, the war captain. And, and Joshua, we're told, fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto him, Joshua, said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, in case we missed it uh, at first glance, uh, the angel pretty well just told us who he was because he's given the same instructions that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. Take off your shoes. They had the ground is holy. That is, it's holy. It's been sanctified by the one standing there. And Joshua bows in worship. And in the next chapter, we are told, and the Lord said to Joshua, so this is the second person of the Trinity. This is our Lord Jesus appearing uh, in pre-incarnate form as the angel of the covenant. The angel of the Lord is Michael, the commander of the Lord's hosts. He's the real leader. Joshua is not the military leader here. The angel of the Lord, Jesus, is the real military leader. And that means that this is more than, than a war of occupation, a war of conquest, a war of territorial acquisition. It's more than a just war. It's a holy war. It's God's own part of God's own war against sin his war for redemption. And to this point, and this would be an interesting topic in itself, although I'm not really planning to going there, but we could talk about the whole idea of holy war to this point. To this point, God's people have not had to fight much as we think of fighting. That is, rarely has God put a sword in their hand and said, go kill somebody. Yeah, there was and the episode with Lot. Theme. Yeah, a Abraham rescued Lot, and you can argue whether or not that was part of the Holy War or simply a just war to rescue a relative, because it didn't do a whole lot for the kingdom of God, when you think about <laughs> it. Uh, and Abraham was not operating under divine orders at that point. But you do come to Joshua's own first battle against Amalek, and right toward the end of the 40 years of wandering, they had fought with Midian and with um, 
a couple of the neighboring Canaanite tribes, Sihon and Og and all of those people. Midian is very confusing to me because Moses' father-in-law yeah. was yeah, apparently a godly man, right? Right. So and then, there, there are Midianites yeah. and then there are Midianites. Okay. There are, <laughs> it wasn't a, it wasn't a homo, homogeneous, homogeneous yeah. nation. Uh, it was a, a loose organization, organization of tribes, apparently, some of whom were godly and some of whom were decidedly not. So, yeah, it's it's it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing. OK, we're related. Are we enemies or not? You worship our God or don't you? Well, you know, it sounds like a, a Thanksgiving dinner. OK, everyone here's family. How many of us are Christians? How many of you who aren't really hate those of us who are and would slit our throats and or pat us over to the thwart. Okay. Just checking it out. Let's have Thanksgiving dinner now. Yeah. Just because they're family doesn't mean they're all on the same side. But the point is, to this point, God, this moment in history, God has not had his people kill very many people in this war mm -hmm. against evil. Mostly, they've stood back and watched while God, say, destroyed the world in a flood or... Um, devastated Egypt or wiped out an entire army in the Red Sea. But we are beginning a phase now when for a short time, about 300 plus years, 400 if you take in the early monarchy, I guess, where God's people will be fighting the wars of the Lord with steel or iron swords and bows and arrows and things like that. And, and so here at the beginning of this, this new phase, more or less, at least certainly with the new captain and with this new project right in front of them, the conquest of Canaan, Jesus shows up and makes it very clear, this is his battle. And although, yes, there's going to be some traditional warfare going on, it's never going to be the traditional warfare that wins the day. And Joshua should remember this. Mm -hmm. Back when, in his first battle, he learned that Israel would only win as long as Israel depended upon the Lord. You remember the whole thing of uh, Aaron Moses, and her. Yeah, holding yeah. up the staff. Holding up the staff, holding up Moses' arms, holding up the staff. And as long as they did so, expressing their dependence on Yahweh, God's people would win when they dropped and they started losing. So Joshua's been through uh, Holy War 1A. Now he's about to do 1B where he's going to see it all happen again. And so perhaps he is not as confused as some people would be when the angel of the Lord says, here's the battle plan. Yeah, oh, I left I, my, par my parchment and quills in the camp. <laughs> we'll have to rely on your memory, Joshua. Here it goes. Uh, I've given into thy hand Jericho, the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Okay, so we're starting with the conclusion. That's comforting. <laughs> yeah. We're, 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 we're going to win and win big. Okay. And you shall, compass the, yeah, you shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go around the city what? And then it all falls to what? Someone will, what happens? Thus shalt thou do six days. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> okay, six. Let me find that parchment. Six. Okay, so for six days, we go around the city. Okay. So we got the army going. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. Not 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 the silver trumpets we use. Ram's horns. Okay, we'll get some rams and get some. Okay. All right. So we got we got priests on a battlefield. Okay, that's kind of new. All right. All right. So we're gonna go around six and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. Okay. I think we're getting up early that morning. That's a lot. <laughs> and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. Got it. Blow trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people will shout with a great shout. It doesn't matter what we say. <laughs> watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Rutabaga, rutabaga, rutabaga. Okay, this is worship. Thing. Just you pick something. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. Oh, it's a miracle thing. Got it. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. okay. I didn't see that coming. I should have, I guess. So it's a long process. In the first six days, basically nothing happens except us walking around the city. That's going to be great. They're going to laugh at this one. But in the seventh day, we're going to go around seven times. Yeah, that's going to be even funnier. 
And then we're going to blow trumpets and shout, and you're gonna make the walls fall down. And then we're just gonna go in and kill people and take their stuff. And, and not take kill, their stuff. <laughs> not, you're not gonna take their stuff, Joshua. Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city. Let me go around it. And let him that's armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. So we got the priests and we've got the soldiers and we've got the Ark and they're going around and the priests are blowing. We're not told what they blew. Single note maybe or a Familiar medley of old favorites. It doesn't matter. Uh, they had. They knew what they were going to do. And uh, the armed men went before the priest that blew the trumpets, and the reward came after the ark, and the priest going on blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I bid you shout, then you shall shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about at once, and they came to the camp and lodged in the camp. Now, you can imagine the people on the walls. This is it. Here they come. Here they come. Here they go. There they there, go. There they go. What? What? Okay, that was weird. Maybe they're scoping us out. I guess. Psychological warfare. I don't know. All right. Okay, we'll keep an eye open. Maybe they'll be back. No, they're not back that day. Next day. All right. Here they're coming. This is going to be it. Here they come. They're doing, they're playing that. What is that note they're sounding? It's really annoying. They're going, okay. They're like leaving. waking up to a car alarm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's leaving. like Groundhog's Day where you think that much. <laughs> 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 it's very much like Groundhog's Day because they keep repeating, you know, and, 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 and like Groundhog's Day, eventually you get really annoyed with the sameness <laughs> of the thing and you start doing things to entertain yourself and to break the tension. You start eventually mocking them. Certain lines from Holy Grail come to mind here. <laughs> Keep walking. <laughs> and so and so for six days. And then at this point, there'd probably be the people in Jericho, knowing standard human nature, are just mocking them and laughing and saying, What are you if you're trying to drive us crazy, it's kind of working, but it's not gonna help because we're in here, we've got food, you can't touch it, and you know it, and we know it, and all this wandering around, this ring around the rosy is getting you nowhere. Come back, we must haunt you again. And then on the Sabbath morning, they do it again. Oh, and then they don't go away. They could do it again. All right, this is it. This is really it. Now, finally, and they do it again and again. And, it, and, and they go seven times. They go around. And the people in Jericho are probably just scratching their heads and saying, what is this idiocy? What is going on here? And then we're told it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And so they shout, and the city collapses. The walls collapse. What happens is that the upper walls fall outward and cascade down the bank, down to the lower walls and over the walls, creating this nice little... I don't a path! Know a path! <laughs> a climbable pile to get a across. climbable pile of rock and rubble so that they can simply go straight up into the now defenseless city and kill everybody in, in their way. However, Joshua does insert at some point, and we haven't even talked about um, the whole Rahab thing, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Have we? I don't think so. Nope, I think that's not. probably next time. Mm -hmm. So Rahab mixes into this, but we won't worry about her right now. But they are told that anything that's gold or silver or brass or iron is to pass through the fire and come into the treasury of the Lord. Uh, the city is put under the ban. It's devoted to the Lord. The Hebrew word is kerim, which can mean given to destruction or given to God, depending on how you're looking at it. It's normally given to God by destruction or passing through fire or judgment of some sort so as to become gods. But it does most certainly mean is no one else gets it. Mm -hmm. And so Jericho is to become a heap. The precious treasures that will survive the fire are going to go to the tabernacle, 
Guts Temple and be kept there and be used. Everything else is to be let alone except, well, torched in the whole cities to go up in flames because this is first fruits. God claims this one absolutely. From here on out, whatever the children of Israel conquer, they get to keep. They can become spoils of war. But to make things very clear right up front, this is God that gave them the city. They did not do this by their might, by the strength of their arm, by their intelligence or resources. They did not come up with this strategy and these tactics. And even if they had, it wouldn't have worked because this is a miracle. God had to do this. And so they are to keep their hands off. And Joshua even places a curse upon the city, cursed to be the man who rises up and rebuilds Jericho, which actually happens much, much later on. But again, that's, that's probably for a different time. Uh, what the children of Israel learn, or what they ought to have learned, is that when it comes to the battles of the Lord, God fights them. Uh, we don't win by ourselves, not by our strength, not by our wisdom, not because we have some cool plan or some cool technology. It's the battle is the Lord's. And now in this case, there was real bloodshed. In the new, under the new covenant, we don't go out and kill people or threaten to kill people in order to make them Christians. We have different weapons and the sword of the spirit. Uh, takes the place of a sword of iron. But there is something that we do see here that, that's really important, and that's that every step of the way in, in preparing for this battle has been worship. We started with the baptism, the circumcision, the Passover. We have priests on the battlefield blowing trumpets. We have the ark itself going into battle. One of the few times it actually <laughs> does with God's sanction Indiana Jones to the contrary. <laughs> and it is when they shout and blow the trumpets, both acts of worship, that God steps in and throws down the walls. Then finally they get with the hacking and the slaying and the stabbage and all that. But none of that would mean anything if they hadn't thrown themselves wholly on God and his mercies and trusted his promises. And if God had not responded uh, as sovereign Lord of heaven and earth by... Throwing down walls that should not be throwable. Uh, and, and, and so as we, as we look at this and we consider its application to us, I, I've heard weird applications. I remember one young man saying that the way he, he got his wife, uh, they were at some kind of marriage seminar or something. And the pastor said that if you want to win the heart of a young lady, you need to go march around her seven times and shout and claim the... <laughs> battle and the walls of her heart will fall down and the young man said and so that's how i got married wow oh my and i was gonna say let me know how that goes but apparently it did apparently actually it it did happen <laughs> hmm. uh i think john MacArthur may mention that in one of one of his books on the charismatic movement and on finding god's leading <laughs> but yeah that, that's not the kind of, of application we're looking for um in fact, the Bible does itself apply this right at the end of everything. So Revelation chapter 11. I don't know if I've talked about this yet, but I think we come back to it more than once. What happens here is we're running through the, um, the trumpet judgments on Babylon, and we come to the seventh trumpet. And we're told this. This is chapter 11, Revelation, verse 15. Uh, the seventh angel sounded, and there, was, there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are and listen is to come. Uh, for thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great ha hail. And yes, we have talked about this. We talked about this in the context of Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Day. Mm, that's right. Because the the Day of Trumpets 
begins the seventh month of the liturgical calendar. So each month to that point, all six of them, had been marked by the blowing of a trumpet. Each new moon month was announced by the blowing of a trumpet. And so Rosh Hashanah, New Year's Day, is announced by the blowing of the seventh trumpet. Well, in the story of Jericho, we have seven trumpets all together. And just as there, they were the honor guard that led into the Ark of the Covenant. So here, after the blowing of the seven trumpets, we see the Ark of God, <clears throat> the heart of the ceremonial heart of the, of the covenant. But it's no longer on earth. It's no longer in an earthly temple. It's no longer in the Holy of Holies. It's in heaven itself. In other words, that's where Jesus is. Mm -hmm. The heart of the covenant is now in heaven in Christ himself. But this, this city that has persecuted the saints, and we see more of it as we go through the book of Revelation, uh, it's, it, it collapses in the midst of all this. Uh, we're looking back at verse 13. The same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake was slain had been 7,000, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Later on, we see this city burned with fire. So there are echoes here. And what one of the many things that Revelation is telling us, it's a major theme of the book, is that the wars of the Lord under the New Covenant are not fought with swords, they're not fought with guns, they're not fought with nuclear missiles or drones or nuclear submarines or uh, strategic, strategic defense initiative weapons, <laughs> Star Wars beams. They're fought with the gospel. They're fought with prayer. They're fought with faith and confidence in God's promises. They're fought with worship. Uh, and, and that's where we have to begin. It is so easy to jump immediately to political action mm -hmm. or to go pouring out into the streets and saying, love demands that we burn down the city. You know, it, no, it doesn't. It never really does that. And certainly there's a time for a, a nation to defend itself militarily or a man to protect his home using... Um, guns or whatever. But that's not how the gospel progresses. That's not how the kingdom of God progresses. There's time and place for such things, but that's not how we win this. That's not how God's kingdom comes. And we have to keep reorienting ourselves. We keep wanting to think that the newest piece of technology, the newest innovation on the internet, the newest form of social media, this is the key that's going to unlock the future of the kingdom of God and that's going to change everything. And while God may use many of these things in his time, as he used the printing press, say, the printing press did not save the world. <laughs> and uh, radio did not save the world. TV sure didn't save the world. And cell phones, <laughs> I'm not sure what they're doing right now. And social media, yeah, that's another story altogether. But we, we are such, particularly we in America being in the 21st century, are such a generation of people who think that the latest thing that we got in our hands is going to be the thing that ushers in utopia, that brings in the millennium. Mm -hmm. The and iPhone 13 will bring world peace. <laughs> 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 and, and I'm not surprised, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they advertised it. And I also wouldn't be surprised if an awful lot of people believed it. <laughs> yeah. and, and accuse those of us who don't buy one of being hostile to world peace. Because, you know, <laughs> it's one heck of a marketing campaign. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to think it would take a heck of a marketing campaign, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think just a few careful tweets and such would probably, you know, set the whole world aflame because we are naive and stupid and our sinful nature, the flesh, constantly is looking for some thing we can do that will restore paradise, that will bring in the city of, well, God. Mm. But it's really the city of man in disguise mm -hmm. uh, that will restore unity and community and freedom and love and all that's happy and sweet, total acceptance, plenty of food for everybody, no freedom from want and fear and whatever all those other freedoms were. And there is a thing we can do and once I find out what the thing is, I will do it, especially if it's really easy. <laughs> I will do it. And then I will look at you and see that you are not doing it. And I will laugh you to scorn and call you names on social media because you are not doing it. And you obviously do not love the way I love. 
You are not grounded the way I'm grounded. You do not understand the big picture. You're either an idiot or you hate grandma. Sorry if this sounds familiar and if I'm getting a little passionate because this is our world right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the next thing's going to be, but considering what really stupid things we've been told to do in the last several years to save the world, it can't it can't get much stupider. <laughs> You would think. Don't don't issue that challenge. <laughs> this, is, this is so. This is so. Um, and uh, perhaps the most ironic thing in all of this with the pandemic is how easily Christians gave up true biblical worship mm -hmm. and went looking for other solutions to the problems. Uh, when God calls us to worship, now we we all, we all understand that sometimes in emergencies a church can't meet them. There's 10 feet of snow outside. All right, well, we're not going anywhere. It's called providentially hindered. <laughs> providentially hindered. It's a category. It's a thing. My ass fell in a ditch. I can I can get him out and, and skip church today. Uh, the Germans are bombing London. Can St. Paul's please not have its lights on tonight? You know, we, we, we know about that. There's nothing new in theology there. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But having said that, to assume that in our wisdom and knowledge and scientific expertise and political programming, we can come up with better solutions than God has, starting with ignoring his worship. Well, there's something fundamentally wrong with us. And it, it was far too easy, and speaking now as an elder of a church, it was far too easy, and it still is, for people to have walked out and not come back Sometimes because there were masks and sometimes because there weren't enough masks. That's really odd when the same thing can generate opposite reactions from people who are yelling and screaming at each other in social media. But they end up doing the same unbiblical thing, walking away from the worship of the Lord. Mm. Which suggests that there is something satanic behind all of this. Uh, have you ever noticed, this is a side note, have you ever noticed that Satan is not very creative? He doesn't have to come up with really convoluted, intricate schemes to throw us off. He comes up with real simple, stupid stuff, and it works way too often. <laughs> yeah. There's that yeah. line about um, why it's hard to create the bear-proof trash can at national parks that mm -hmm. is also able to be used by the average person. It's because there's a significant <laughs> overlap between the intelligence of the smartest bear and the dumbest tourist. <laughs> Oh, okay. That was good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we, we again, and, and here, insert the entire book of Galatians in this discussion of walking in the flesh. We are so moved to, to look for that one filthy rag we can hold up to God and say, mm -hmm. here's the power of the spirit. I have, I've learned this. I know this. I have chosen this. I've done this. I have felt this. And when we have, we pick, depending on our denominational background, we pick one of those. And it's supposed to save the world and change the world and everything will be better. If the world's even savable, but it'll, it'll be the thing at least that we need right now for whoever, whoever we are and whatever we want. And if you do believe in some kind of optimistic eschatology, if you do believe in some kind of, whether it be a uh, a pagan utopia, or whether it be the growth of the kingdom of God along evangelical lines, it's try this this attempt to jump ahead of God, leave worship behind as a sort of well, yeah, we did that. Now let's get to the important stuff. Yeah, I go to church on Sunday, but now let's go out and change the world. Yeah, you you, you, know, you can't change the world if you don't bow in worship, and worship means on God's terms, mm -hmm. not stuff we 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 create. Yeah, there's even um, I know I've 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 heard some people, and they could just be crazy French people online, but you never know these days. Oh, no. uh, who I basically... heard French people. You said fringe, right? Said I said fringe. fringe uh, although okay. they could be crazy French people as well. Who knows? Um, but you know, they basically say, "Oh well, the Beatitudes are not a permanent thing in the Christian life. Like you don't have to follow that when you know the world's Christian. You can." Go persecute everyone that isn't a Christian when when the world is fully Christian. What? It's like, uh, oh yeah, Twitter. It's Twitter. It's probably fringe, fringe, crazy people. But like that's not was... how that's not how the system works. You don't get to say, yeah. oh well, now that we're in charge, you know, we don't have to be nice anymore. We don't have to yeah. have the fruit of the spirit. 
So I was watching a TV show recently, um, Clarkson's Farm on Mm. Amazon, and the guy's explaining Twitter to someone who's never heard of Twitter. And he says, Twitter is where leftist people go to say increasingly leftist things to other leftist people. (laughs) And it was just the most accurate summary I'd ever heard. (laughs) Like that conformed exactly to my experience. (laughs) Um, I was about to say, what's wrong with that description? I feel like there's also a a, a healthy contingent where it's increasingly right-wing people showing up to say ever more right wing things to um <laughs> to right wing people for uh right wing kudos points and <laughs> yeah. but they're only saying it because the leftists are there and they have to stand in contradistinction to the leftists that's also right. true and yeah. i feel like the leftists are doing the same thing except that they're not interacting with the right wing people right. on there they're just like i heard that right wing people do this and i'm going <laughs> to say the opposite <laughs> yeah yeah I was going to go for the third class, apparently, which is the naive, stupid people who think that reality is now being defined before their very eyes and all they have to do is pick a choice here between the one of the two. And it's as if God had spoken from Sinai. Oh, wait. Well, the man with the blue check mark said it. It must be true. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's Back the fall of Jericho, to... and there's no it's not surprising that it resonates throughout our history down to the black spiritual that I think Ryan started this with. Because you know what? The the the, the black slaves in the Antebellum South were not fomenting slave rebellion. They weren't out to murder their masters, they weren't out for military solution. They did want real freedom on an economic, financial, and personal level, but they wanted God to save them. These were prayers to God. God did this. And as they worked in the fields, they prayed to God that there would be deliverance. So there, there is something to be learned. I, uh, one of the first, well, the first black spiritual I ever learned was that. It came on a record with some other things. I think it was done by George Beverly Shea, who used to swing, sing with Billy Graham. You know, magnificent voice, truly not um, a black church choir, which would have been even better. <laughs> But it's it stayed with me, uh, and I can still I still remember it from there. It's it is it is a good thing to sing about if we understand what happened. Joshua fought the battle, but yet, as the song goes on to say, it's God who says the battle is in your hand. I'm giving it to you. And as as with so many things, this this is in many ways this is the theme of the New Testament. Will you trust Jesus Christ to be your savior from everything, from all of your sins and all of your guilt and all the consequences of sin? Or are you going to come up with something else that you can add to the mix, something a little bit better than God's plan, and then try to win everyone to your side and laugh at everybody as old fashioned and too conservative and retro because they're not on board with you and your marvelous plan to save the world? Are you going to believe the gospel? It's, it just seems so naive sometimes to say, look, the solution here is the gospel. Well, how can that help anything? How can dead men throwing stones help anything? we got to get past that. Until we have living people, nothing's happening here. Um, so one thing that we will continue to pursue in this podcast, as long as God allows us to go on, is the hope of the gospel, that God saves people. And cer- most certainly that has consequences in all areas of life. This is This is halting towards Zion, which is a city, a civilization, a culture. But we halt. Power is God's. We limp. God gets us there. Yeah. All right. Shall we wrap up with some recommendations? Let's do it. All right. Do you, yeah, well, go, you first? go first? Oh, I, I feel <laughs> like mine is whimsical enough that it should go first. Oh, okay, okay Brian. You go first. I mean, it's not whimsical based upon my lived personal experience, but um, it is more whimsical probably than either of yours. I'm going to recommend antihistamines because (laughs) the past few weeks have been torture and Allegra has saved my life. We are not sponsored by Allegra, but I will gladly plug them. (laughs) Good stuff. Yes. All right. Um, I will go next. I will recommend, I was going to recommend the TV show Clarkson's Farm because I watched it recently when I was under the weather, and it brought me much joy. Um, It is rated the equivalent of R 
for language. <laughs> That's the only thing about it. Also, like there are farm animals and they do farm animal things. <laughs> if that bothers you, I guess don't watch it. <laughs> um, so, so I guess I'm taking two recommendations because I can't not mention my next thing, which is the book A Fiery Gospel by Richard Gamble. Uh, speaking of righteous war, um, this is a history of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Ooh. And it is really excellent. It's not too long. I think it's maybe 200 pages-ish. One of the things I appreciate so much about Richard Gamble is that he never forgets that his subjects are people. They're human mm. beings, and they were sincere. Um, so he has a very charitable style, but he doesn't pull any punches either. <laughs> so, uh, so for those, okay, Emily, mm -hmm. most Christians know the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, first of all, they don't know that well, that's what it's called. They just know the chorus, glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> and they have no idea that it is in some ways, shall we say, controversial. Oh, it's controversial. It's very <laughs> controversial. Yes. My the first Aren't pastor there two of our versions church, of it. Mm, there's a couple at least. And then yeah. you count the original prototype that went before it. Uh the pastor of uh, the first pastor of our church was from South. You did not play that song in his presence. Yeah, I don't think uh, any Christian <laughs> should be forced to sing this song. <laughs> no. Like... <laughs> can you can you throw people a little uh since this is a yeah. You know, Jericho and blowing trumpets and things. Can you give our listeners a little idea of why it's such a thing? Why it's objectionable in my view? Yeah. 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 So, first of all, it is theologically bankrupt as <laughs> the contemporaries of the author recognized it was it only took about a generation or two for people to say ah yes this is totally unobjectionable and that was for the reason that it had no theological content <laughs> they said yes this is not specific to any particular religious sect so all americans should be able to sing it uh -huh. um yeah because it says things about christ that are not true <laughs> and are not found <laughs> anywhere in scripture and yet it's soaked in the rhetorical likeness of scripture because mm -hmm. julia ward howe was the author very familiar with scripture she was a unitarian by the way yes. um and very close with the transcendentalists mm -hmm. so yeah it's its origins are not the greatest and when you when you look at how it's been used in history, and it has been used, not just mm. sung, yeah. uh, you see that it's been used to further all sorts of causes that have nothing to do with the cause of Christ. And so you have this f entangling of civil religion and religious nationalism with actual religion. And these two things cannot actually occupy the same space. <laughs> so part of Poly Gamble's work, principle. yeah, uh, <laughs> part of Dr. Gamble's work in this book is to try and work at disentangling those two things. So what is the, now, now I want to read it. What's the mm -hmm. name of the book again? The name of the book is A Fiery Gospel. Fiery oh, yes. Gospel. That reminds me, I need to update my Goodreads. I've, I've read at least eight books since I last updated it. <laughs> nice. Wow. I'm glad I'm not in Goodreads. I'd be embarrassed. I've read like <laughs> two two Perry Mason murders and uh, some door, some uh, P. D. James. And... It's summer, okay. I'm back to mine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to judge you for taking a break from your I, job. I was I was watching TV last week instead of reading like all week, so I have no room to judge. But do you have no. a recommendation for us? Um. Yeah, I'm going to go for something kind of soft, but kind of not. As we got near the end of the school year, when we were American history, we were passing through um, World War One. World War One. World War One. I was trying to communicate um, to my class Woodrow Wilson's conception of himself as a messianic figure out to save the world, bring in a, a, a new world order. To do this, I, I went online and found that the television series Young Indiana Jones hmm. is available for free. Nice. And the the episode when Young Indy, it's a 20-something, I guess, is serving 
um, the American diplomatic corps in Paris during the session that ends in the Treaty of Versailles. Oh my gosh. Is absolutely marvelous and depressing and realistic. I, I, they, not that they, they follow the actual historical events, but the, the mood, the setting, the way the characters are operating. All Young Indy does is basically hand people pens <laughs> and have arguments with Lawrence of Arabia, who himself was a young man at the time, about the basic principles. And Young Indy is the typical true believer. Wilson's a great man. He's out to save the world. Like, they trust <laughs> him. And Lawrence is saying, you may can trust him, but look at all these other people. There's the, you're, This is not going to be what you think it's going to be. And we see the German envoys arrive and how horribly they're treated. And in the background, there's this young man trying to get a word into the conference. And Young Indy eventually arranges it for him. He's uh, he's a waiter at the time in, in a hotel in Paris. But he's uh, from Vietnam. I believe his name is Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, so a little bit of everything. And for people who like Indiana Jones, first of all, the series is really great. It's... Young Indy has his romantic flings here and there, and he has to watch out for that. But uh, George Lucas originally created the series to give his kids something to watch on TV that wasn't complete garbage and that might educate them a little bit. And so in every episode, Young Indy runs into um, famous characters who lived between 1910 and 1930. And it at least gives you some reference of, oh, Dad, was that the character we saw? Yes, it was. <laughs> oh, this character, he keeps talking about, about history going around in circles. Did, did the real man really say? Yes. <laughs> Arthur Schlesinger really said those things. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, young Indiana Jones, particularly the one set in Paris uh, during the Treaty of Versailles. That's my recommendation. Lovely. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, thank you to all of our listeners for listening. Um, and if you would like to join the financial supporters, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can also find us at haltingtowardsion.com, but the support link is at anchor. We did confirm that. You can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. <laughs>